Good afternoon to our viewers in Europe and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for the latest installment in our virtual series titled Zupa Valya 2024. In this series, we're looking at some of the important elections taking place around the world this year. And today, we're going to focus on the elections in the United Kingdom, which were held earlier this month. To help us understand what's going on in the UK, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome award-winning German journalist, Aneta Dittat. She serves as the London Bureau Chief and Senior Correspondent for the German public broadcaster, ARD, and has been based in London since 2008. Aneta, herzlich willkommen. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Danke <laughs> schön. So, Aneta, you have been in the UK a long time. You have yeah. seen lots of changes at Downing Street uh, and in British politics as a whole. So I thought before we dive into the discussion about the election earlier this month, maybe the two of us could set the stage a little bit. Um, former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced a general election for the 650-seat House of Commons for July 4th. This was the first election since the UK left the European Union in 2020, and the Labour Party had a landslide victory, which brought an end to 14 tumultuous years under the leadership of the Conservative Party, which saw five different prime ministers. Um, I thought maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about the political landscape um, before the election, and perhaps in broad brushstrokes, give us um, an overview of the main political figures and their party platforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm very happy to do that. I mean, where do I start? My God, this was really a very tumultuous phase in British politics and increasingly so. Um, the most um, defining um, topic during this election and over the last year since Britain really left the EU was basically the slow and then ever faster decline of the Conservative Party who basically imploded at this election, which was the end of a long phase where where, where, it, where they had started to go, yeah, more or less, I mean, sorry for be, to be so blunt, but to, to become increasingly bonkers. Mm -hmm. um, the main problem was that Brexit um, was a project that was never meant to happen, even by those who were very much in favor of it, like Boris Johnson or Michael Gove in 2016. They thought this is never going to happen, but we will nevertheless embody that position because it will bring us into strategically a better position within this party. The party always had this very strong, very right-wing nationalistic um, yeah, group um, that became increasingly strong around 2016 that had to be appeased. But what happened instead of appeasing them was that after Brexit happened and nobody knew what to do, um, and, and the Tories really didn't have a plan how to implement it, and they didn't know um, how to deal with the EU. There was nothing prepared, pure incompetence uh, to a degree that Brussels and the Europeans became increasingly suspicious and thought maybe that's the specifically cunning tactics, mm -hmm. uh, because Britain had a completely different reputation in Brussels, not of this kind of clown show that, that unfolded over the years. So... This all went terribly wrong. Uh, we now have the results of Brexit, if you like, by the uh, independent kind of finance uh, institute, the OBR, who have been saying, I mean, it's, it's an independent institution, institute that is uh, looking at numbers for the government. And, and so it's, it's you have to take this seriously. And they have been saying now a few times uh, as other think tanks have, that Brexit will cost the British GDP 4% every year, and it might become even more, depending on how much the EU is, is sort of um, going in other ways, and Britain will have to realign somehow. So the whole thing has been a total failure, economically, um, ideologically, there has been no global Britain. I mean, Brits have understood that um, yeah, that basically Britain has become more insulated. I mean, not least by 
Joe Biden, who was here a few times and made it very clear that he didn't even want to have a longer chat with Rishi Sunak, which was quite humiliating. The whole thing about the special relationship, that's such an important mantra for whoever is governing here, basically fell apart. So more or less, Brits noticed this whole thing was a scam, even those in the north, the more, let's say, yeah, poorer areas that, that felt a bit like the Trump voters that they... Um, would profit from that. I mean, they noticed everything has become worse. Nothing works anymore. Broken Britain is sort of the... Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was mainly the reason why um, the Tories lost so badly. I mean, it was the worst defeat in their history. Um, they lost more than 200 MPs out of 400 they had before. Yeah, and Labour won with a landslide, um, mm -hmm. which... Um, was mostly down to the electoral system because it was it's the first past the post like like you guys have in the US. So uh, people have been voting tactically. Uh, and the main motive behind the voter, the, the way people voted here was to get the Tories out. It mm -hmm. was not so much um, a kind of euphoric, optimistic vote for Labour, but it was mostly we have enough of this party that isn't a conservative party anymore either because they've been moved by Boris Johnson so far to the right over the years um, um, that it was basically a bit like the Republicans, although you shouldn't make direct comparisons, but uh, I would say since 2019, the Tory party has, you couldn't really call it, and I didn't in my reports, call it a conservative party anymore. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Brexit basically destroyed this party as a conservative party and destroyed um, is it as a party as such, because, I mean, they're so they're in such a desperate state. Now, I don't know whether they will be reemerged from this as, as the kind of party they have been before. Mm -hmm. It's so, probably you know, a little too early to be able to, to think about how the the Conservative Party recovers from this, um, what the path forward is for the Tories. And I think there's much more attention at the moment about you know, what to expect from the new Labour government, particularly given the large um, uh, majority that they have. But before we we get to that, um, you did mention uh, the, the first past the post voting system. Uh, just for our viewers, um, people in constituencies across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland have the opportunity to elect their members of parliament to represent a specific area or region. Um, but because of this electoral system, there can be discrepancies between the share of seats won by a party and the share of the popular vote. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this this system works and how many seats a party needs in order to have a majority? Yes, I can. I mean, it's it's as far as I know, I mean, you know that better. It's, it's pretty similar to the US. I mean, every constituency votes for its candidates for the different parties and then only the first one gets through. So that means if you have a constituency where it's pretty safe and secure and clear that Labour will, will win and will get it, people in this case, 2024 in this election did very often say, okay, Labour will win anyway. I'm fine with that. So I'll vote for the Greens because I think generally Labour is maybe not green enough. Um, but they mostly did that in constituencies where um, Labour had a safe seat. That means British voters know their voting system and they voted in a way that Labour would win, but very often gave them, didn't give them their voice or their, 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 yeah, their voice directly. So um, in a way, the popular vote and the vote share was very low for Labour. They had only 34%, which isn't much. But on the other hand, that has always been the case in Britain. So I think it's still a legitimate thing to call this a landslide and, and a clear mandate they have, because voters know the system, as I said. Also, David Cameron, for example, had also never more than 36% of the vote share. So overall, this is quite a normal thing in Britain, although quite a few um, yeah, columnists and, and think tanks rightly said this is quite a shallow um, support for Labour after all. It's more mm -hmm. clear end of the Tories. We have enough of that party uh, vote than it, it has been an optimistic, hopeful vote for Labour. On the other hand, to, to be fair, Starmer never really um, gave anything away that could create any kind of 
optimism really or some hope. He was very defensive and always more or less, I mean, more or less fought this election campaign by saying, um, give me your vote and I'll prove you that I can fix this thing. Mm -hmm. So he, he didn't even, yeah, he didn't even promise that he would be a charismatic, wonderful person with ideas for the future. He just said, listen, guys, we need to fix this. And I'm, I'm a serious person and I will fix this for you if you trust me. And I think that's what happened. People have trusted him and gave him sort of the mandate to now do something, but he will obviously have to work for it. And um, his honeymoon period could be very brief if um, he doesn't deliver rather soon. So it, it won't be easy times because the economic situation in Britain is extremely difficult and Starmer has, and then I'll close this thing and you can keep uh, asking other questions. I don't want to be too long either, but Starmer has excluded um, to undo Brexit. Mm -hmm. which will make it very difficult for him to repair the economic damage that has been done. So that will be one of the rather complicated uh, construction sites he will have to work on. Mm -hmm. And I'm personally not really convinced how this is going to happen if he doesn't if he really wants to stick to these red lines that he doesn't want to either rejoin the single market nor the customs union. But that's that's sort of something everybody is now quite, yeah, curiously looking at how he will sort of get out of this conundrum. So, Annette, I definitely want to pick up on a couple of the different um, items that you mentioned in your comments just now, because it was very compact and, and dense. There were yeah, lots sorry. of different things. But, but, but one thing I certainly want to ask you about um, is you know, this, this, this notion, not so much of a, of a labor victory as much as a, a Tory loss and um, the relatively low showing for labor at 34%. Um, this undoubtedly ties into the fact that voter turnout was incredibly low as well. Um, there was just a report that was released by the Institute for Public Policy Research that found that only 52% of UK adults um, took part in the elections on July 4th, and that this was the lowest share um, of the of the vote uh, or of voters uh, since universal suffrage was introduced in 1928. Um, you know, two questions related to that. One is why do you think voter turnout was so low? Um, and the other is, did did this impact uh, the election results? If voter turnout had been higher, do you think things could have gone differently? First question, uh, I think this extremely low turnout, I think that's the more worrying thing than the 34% of the popular vote, because as I said, that's quite common and has happened before. But the voter turnout is is the really worrying thing in this election. And I think it has a lot to do with the complete breakdown of trust in politics in Britain that is at an all time low, which again has a lot to do with Brexit, because at the end of the day, they promised the world what would happen with it. And it turned out to be all lies. And um, voters, especially those who have been voting for the Tories for the first time, and that was quite a lot in 2019, uh, when Johnson famously really was able to to get a huge majority mm -hmm. even uh, from traditional labor voters who would normally never have voted tory um he promised he would get brexit done and it would all be great and wonderful and the exact opposite has turned out and he's disappeared he was i mean he's been basically thrown out of his um of, of downing street by his own party because he was lying and not by not adhering to the rules during the pandemic yeah. so there has been a huge huge and deep disappointment in politics and a deep mistrust that has been fed at the same time from the far right from farage and the reform party uh who said they have lied to you they just didn't do brexit properly um but people aren't stupid they know this is also not true so it's a huge yeah, loss of trust that is very worrying because it, it this remains fertile soil for another wave of populism if Starmer cannot turn things around pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, related to, to Starmer, um, uh, as you said, right, his performance um, really puts him in the, the top echelon of, of labor leaders. 
um, the seat share that that he received um, and that the Labor Party received is close to what was achieved by Tony Blair in 1997 and 2001. Um, how much do you think this has to do with Keir Starmer? Um, and how much does it have to do just with the um, with the situation on the ground and that almost any labor um, alternative would have been better than the Tory party? I think it has a lot to do with Keir Starmer in so far as he has been leading or led an extremely disciplined campaign. Um, this was probably the most disciplined campaign a Labour leader has ever managed to impose on his own party. Um, they have really done, made, really did their homework and, and focused on constituencies they, they could get. I mean, to a point where they would tell people in safe constituencies to not even put any efforts in there anymore. So they really did a very did very thorough research before they started and, and did it really well. And he also managed to discipline his party, which was, let's not forget that only two years before with Jeremy Corbyn, quite a basket case. Mm -hmm. All this shows that Starmer is uh, as a as a politician and as a yeah now as a prime minister and party leader, an extremely efficient manager. And he's exactly what the Tories haven't been anymore. He's competent and people to believe him that he can fix things. And I think that has a lot to do with this landslide victory, because as you rightly said, I mean, this is only seven seats uh, from that famous Tory uh, Labour victory uh, that Tony Blair had uh, managed to, to um to get in 1997 so um this is a huge victory even if with this low voter turnout it, it's a bit overshadowed by that and the, the vote share isn't that high but still i mean and it shows i think it, it's not something that would have happened anyway mm -hmm. i think it has a lot to do with starmer being a trustworthy figure a very sober man who is a bit boring and that's something Brits normally do not like so much in their politicians, but they were really done with, with clowns, mm -hmm. uh, just to put it bluntly. So I think his, his kind of comp air of competence, his honesty to not promise things, not promise the world anymore, mm -hmm. just say, listen, this, he more or less said the situation is difficult and it, it will need time to fix it, but I will try yeah. Generally, I think this whole attitude did, did sort of make Labour so electable this time. It, it wouldn't necessarily happen with another leader. Can you tell us a little bit more perhaps about his his political background or his sort of political vatigang? Um, I think for a lot of people here in the US, certainly um, he he was he's not as familiar as some of the other British politicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same in Europe. Everybody asks, who is this guy? <laughs> I mean, he's been quite, um, yeah, he's not a charismatic leader and nobody you would you would look at, um, yeah, in, in a theater show or something. He is, I mean, he, he keeps, re he kept repeating that during the campaign uh, up to a point where people got really bored. Uh, he's famously the son of a tool maker. He comes from a working class background, had a very difficult family history with a chronically ill mother. He doesn't like talking about it, but he had been um, convinced by his campaign strategists and advisors to do that a bit more during the campaign. And he did it, I thought, rather well. I mean, he's, he's a bit timid and doesn't like to talk about these things. He must have always been, and that's what his biographer, Tom Baldwin, who wrote a very good book on him for those who are interested in, in Starmer's biography, uh, kept saying, I mean, he's been very ambitious from the very start. He's been um, studying law, was later in Oxford partly, which is also unusual for some working class boy, let's put it that way, especially when he was young uh, in those days. So he has basically worked his way to the top um, as a hard worker, again, very disciplined. He uh, was a human rights lawyer. Um, he was the director of prosecution, which is a very high and important, um, yeah, I don't know what the comparison would be in America, like Uber Staatsanwalt in Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, has sort of um, been quite successful wherever he was, but he's one of these men who you easily underestimate. And I think that's one of the reasons how he made the way up. I mean, he was something that he has been reproached again and again. He was very loyal to Jeremy Corbyn while he was there. Mm -hmm. While it was quite clear that he didn't really support his politics. And that's why the Tories tried to make sort of 
said try to to tell people that he is is a snake who would sort of change his mind all the time but i think he's he's an institutionalist so he really thought i rather stay with in the within the party and then try to change it once this is over which he did than to just say bye this is not my party anymore but um yeah he sort of worked his way to the top coming from a very modest background working class background which is not an easy thing to do in britain mm -hmm. uh, with a very deeply entrenched class system and interestingly enough he also now has surrounded himself in his cabinet with lots of ministers who equally like him come from working class backgrounds i think this is the first cabinet uh, a British uh, prime minister has appointed where you have more women and uh, state school kids who have these kind of diverse backgrounds than ever before. So sticking with, with him for just a second, you had mentioned earlier in our conversation that you know in his campaigning um, and since the election, uh, he's he's maybe not been super charismatic. He's not created optimism or hope. He's not made big promises about the future. And yet in some of the reporting that I've been reading, it sounds as if there are, there are definitely voters who hope that, that the new prime minister and his party will sort of rejuvenate the country during the five-year term that it's won. Um, there are some pundits who are even talking about a second term already and thinking about Keir Starmer as, as PM for 10 years, not just for, for five. Can you help us understand why why that might be the case? Why there there could be this real sense of of optimism and hope that there will be major change, even though that's not something that he has promised. I mean, he has promised that there will be change without painting an overly optimistic picture that this will be easily achievable. That's, I think, the difference. But he has promised that he will do his very very best and in a on a very in a with a very serious approach to fix what is wrong. And there's a lot of things that are broken and not working anymore in Britain. I mean, you know, the whole health system is, is on its feet because it has been massively underinvested for, for 14 years, basically, since the Tories came to power. Same with the schools. The, the state schools are in, in a really bad state. So most even lower middle class parents are trying to scratch together some money to get their peoples into private schools which is, is really hardly affordable for most people here, but otherwise you get really bad schools. So, hosp I mean, so many things don't work. The judicial system, there's no judges. The prisons are overfilled. They have to now release 20,000 people from the prisons because there's no space left anymore, things the Tories mm -hmm. didn't really touch on. So there's so many things that need to be repaired. And Starmer made it quite clear during the campaign that he cannot do that within two, three years. And he always said, actually, what I really need to fix this and to turn things around in a sustainable way would be another term. And that's how I think this kind of conversation got started. And people are fully aware of how bad things are. And I mean, the big question now is whether the, I mean, not so much about a second term, but whether there will be enough patience for him to turn things around slowly, because none of these things that needs need, need to repair now can be done quickly. For me, I think the biggest problem he has sort of um, created himself in a way is to categorically say he won't reverse Brexit. Mm -hmm. Because um, A, he w there is no quick economic um, kind of progress to be made without reversing Brexit. I mean, the British economy is on its, I mean, parts, not all of it, but parts are really in a bad state because they have been basically excluded from their own biggest market just in front mm -hmm. of their door. And um, the, the and they and they now started openly saying it. They didn't dare to say that under the Tories because they would just do nothing or even punish them. Yeah. So that was the fear, at least. The other problem that Starmer will have with that is that eight, according to um, some polls I've just been reading now, 78% of its own of his own Labour members want to rejoin the EU. And, and uh, they have been quiet during the election campaign because they said, okay, fine, if he doesn't want to touch this hornet's nest during the campaign, fully understandable, L let him not talk about that, let him just win these elections. But right. these guys will not stay quiet. And I'm pretty sure that there is nothing to be gained from he will not do anything. Um, he will just try to do some kind of rapprochement 
um, mm -hmm. little baby steps over the next one, two years. But I think in the long run, even, even over the next five years, I think he has to ditch a few of these red lines if he really wants progress. But that is something I think that he has really created some kind of conundrum for himself there. Mm -hmm. Partly because of also quite realistic um, assessment of Brussels' position, because Brussels isn't really ready to have Britain back. I mean, right. there are deep scars in Brussels, the way Britain behaved during Brexit. I mean, mostly Johnson, and they really do not want this kind of story again. So I think Starmer also knows that Brussels isn't very keen on having Britain back at the moment, unless they could be totally sure that there won't be another attempt by the Tories to reverse it again in, in five years' right. time. So, so they have to demonstrate that they're really reliable and really committed. Yes. And that's, um, that's a long process, I think. So it's probably a realistic assessment to exclude that, but this will create frictions within his party and also uh, with, with business. Yeah. Um, you've you've talked a little bit about some of the, the issues that mobilized voters um, and certainly economic difficulty uh, was a factor in this election. And it's something that's top of mind for for many people in the UK. Um, I, I'm curious if there were other issues that played a key role in the election or in campaigning. Um, including sort of foreign policy issues like the war in Ukraine, but also the, the conflict in the Middle East, um, the war in Gaza. Uh, were those topics that topics that, that played a central role in, in campaigning? The dominant topic was the cost of living crisis. I mean, the, the health system that is on its knees. Also other things like the water quality. I mean, it's, it sounds surreal, but we have... Is massive issues with sewage being released into the rivers, the sea, wherever. So even drinking water has been contaminated to a point that people ended up in London in hospitals because wow. literally the shit came back into their system because the whole sewage system is so badly um, run and underinvested. So that that is something that has deeply affected people. That they, they really felt if my drinking water isn't safe anymore, are we living in India here? What is this? Mm -hmm. And this was down to privatization. I mean, that was that started with Sacha and was then, uh, yeah, still was then sort of pushed even further by by having Thames Water and all these water companies um, being privatized who paid huge dividends to their investors but didn't invest over 10, 20 years. And the Tories had weakened all these control institutions like Ofcom or of what who should have looked at that mm -hmm. because they also took money out of all these state institutions because they didn't believe in the state and um and and that increasingly led to quite catastrophic situation and there were huge huge protests and because the Brits love swimming and love their water mm -hmm. and um it's such a small island as well it it that was a very very um th that dominated actually the campaign quite a lot and this was also another kind of almost like an, an image for capitalism or this kind of Wild West capitalism gone wrong mm -hmm. that helped Labour a lot because, I mean, Labour didn't say that they would, would renationalize the water industry, but something needs to be done. And they knew the Tories wouldn't really do anything about it because they hadn't done that for 14 years. So right. that was another thing. The, the war in Ukraine hasn't played a role at all. Interestingly enough, it hasn't been a, a, a big topic here as everybody is more or less on the same page other than in Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, Brits overall think Ukraine should win. And um, there is not, I mean, Farage is the only one, the, the far right um, candidate of the reform party is the only one who's a, more or less hidden sort of secretly pro Putin or not so secretly, but that doesn't work well here when this came out. Uh, before the election, it cost him a few seats, I think. So that's not a big issue. I mean, defense is something that is always seen as something that doesn't divide uh, British the British very much. I mean, they know they have to be there and they want Ukraine to win, which it also has to do a little bit with Boris Johnson, who, uh, for all his faults, very early on said this is, this is an invasion by Russia, and there was never a debate on that. Gaza is a little bit of a different story. Um, there's quite a big 
uh, part of the, especially in the Midlands in the north of England, of Muslim and Muslim population that normally would always have voted for Labour and that left. I mean, that, that was really by Labour and Keir Starmer being so clearly on, on Israel's side. He very early on was asked whether he would be for a ceasefire and he did not really say yes. And it took him three days to correct that a little bit, but that cost um, Labour quite a lot of seats. So mm. that has played a role. Um, um, but overall, it was mostly um, inflation, cost of living crisis, the health system, um, the failed Brexit that has been dominated during mm -hmm. throughout the campaign. Although Brexit wasn't mentioned by neither Labour nor the Tories, but it was still when you asked, when you did reporting on the ground like I did, you would hear it all the time that people yeah. felt really betrayed by, by that. I mean, it's it's undoubtedly a topic that is you know front of mind for a lot a lot of Britons. Um, you, you've you've mentioned Nigel Farage a couple of times, um, and just now you talked a little bit about the Reform Party. Um, the Reform Party is the right wing successor to the Brexit Party and the UK's Independence Party, and it's it's led by Nigel Farage, who I think many of our viewers have have heard about. Um, but he was um, elected to the Parliament for the first time this yes. time. Eight attempt, <laughs> um, and I, I guess the, the the question to you is is you know how do you see um, Farage and the Reform Party um, playing in the Parliament? Um, do you think that there will be tensions between the Reform Party and the Labour Party? Is that something that the Labour Party doesn't really need to worry about because it has? enough a strong enough mandate um you know how, how do you see that interplay between these two parties first of all labor doesn't really need to worry much for the next five years if if no major scandal or whatever happens but traditionally famously the british executive when you have such a strong majority like starmer now has government can pretty much do what it's likes i mean it's very it's very um it's a very strong the ex executive has a very strong position as soon as they have a clear majority in parliament. So he doesn't really need to worry about Farage. Having said that, Farage, I think, is a dangerous figure in British politics. I mean, he's never taken over any kind of responsibility and he won't now with his seat. I'm pretty sure about that. I think he's already now in the States uh, having a stunt with, with Trump. But um, he has played a huge role in Brexit. I mean, he at the time it was the UK party, then it was the Brexit party, there were several transformations, but it's basically always the same party. And UKIP, the existence of UKIP um, drove Cameron into um, the Brexit referendum in the first place. So he very much had a very strong influence on that. And during the Brexit campaign, the Tories being so afraid of the far right made this famous mistake, as we know nowadays, by trying to pandering to them, which basically eventually in 2024 now destroyed them. So he has never done anything apart from being there as the big, a big disruptor, mm -hmm. but a very influential one. And reform um, that came up pretty out of the blue in a way for the Tories has mostly damaged the Tories because um, they lost to, down to the first past the post system. They mostly took votes from uh, the Tories uh, in these constituencies. And so they're mostly, I mean, they really played the biggest part in destroying the Tories. But now, obviously, Farage being in parliament, he will relentlessly attack Labour because that's mm -hmm. now his main enemy. And although I do not think that Starmer needs <clears throat> to worry much about this, and uh, they can't do much as such, this, this is a very strong populist undercurrent. Mm -hmm. is present here. And if you look at the vote chair, Farage and the Reform Party, they only gained uh, five seats, but they had 14% of the votes of the mm -hmm. popular vote, which is quite a lot. That is more or less as high as AFD, the right, right, far right extremist um, German party has had in the last general election. So this is not to be underestimated. So there it's... is... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So there is a very strong, yeah, Far right populist, yeah, current uh, that that is there, and that that I think, especially as the support for Labour has been rather shallow, has to be 
yeah, so, sort of observe very closely. And I think, interesting enough, Starmer is quite aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, there were some advisors who um, had a background talk uh, the other week um, where they clearly said we are fully aware that we that it's not enough to deliver, as we could see with Joe Biden. We yeah. have to fight the far right parallel this, the whole time. There has to be a permanent confrontation and a permanent reminding of the British voter that Farage and the Tories have created nothing but chaos. The, the good thing for Starmer is, I think, different. They can, the British people remember that still, the chaos. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so, so it was so difficult the last years with these constantly changing prime ministers. I mean, the Tories have made such a mess yeah. uh, in power, especially since 2019, that it's quite easy for Starmer, I think, for the next year or two at least, to constantly remind people what Farage is saying, we have that. Mm -hmm. We don't want that again. So I think this awareness of having to confront the far right on a permanent basis and to remind people on a permanent basis of um, them being inefficient, incompetent and chaotic is something that might help because mm -hmm. they have certainly learned that delivering alone, doing delivering good policies, changing things doesn't automatically translate into um, popular support anymore, as mm -hmm. we've seen with Joe Biden. Well, and, and so certainly I think one has to watch Nigel Farage and the Reform Party and see how they position themselves in the, the months and even years ahead. Um, similarly, we'll all be watching the Tory party. I mean, of course, Rishi Sunak um, is no longer prime minister. He also announced that he would step down as Tory leader. He's been asked to stay on until November. Um, do you have any sense of who a possible successor might be? It's difficult to say at the moment because it's just early days and they're at the moment fighting each other quite openly. So you don't know who will survive eventually. Um, there is everything I'm seeing and reading at moving even further right than they were, which is certainly a mistake because there's no votes to be gained. And then you have Farage there anyway. But the um, those people who are still there, and it's a very small group and quite a broken group, are more or less saying that they think they have to move further to the right to beat Farage there. And there's a few who even say that Farage should basically lead their mm -hmm. party, which would probably be the worst possible outcome for the Tories, because you cannot... Britain is this peculiar place. I mean, you have a far right um, a group of the 20 30 percent like in most countries but britain isn't an extreme isn't really very prone to extremist positions in general i mean everything is rather moderate here and um you cannot really win parties uh, elections on the on the far end neither left or right here i mm -hmm. mean that's at least if you look at the last hundred years that has never worked and in a way the transition to a normal government now was quite civilized again even sooner said goodbye in a very, very dignified way. So um, the Brits don't like extremist parties. They do mm -hmm. like to vote for them occasionally. But I can't really see the Tories um, getting anywhere if that's where they're going now. So yeah. my, I, I rather think they will now go, forgive my bluntness, but full bonkers and then mm -hmm. come back maybe in five years renewed and hopefully... Um, as a more centrist conservative party anymore, because in the long run, it is just not good for a democracy if the center right isn't, th there is nobody, because Starmer will now to try, of course, to occupy the center right as well, but this will not be very a very solid position in the long run, because you cannot do that. You will lose, you will lose uh, the left part of the left, leftist part of his party. There will be other conflicts. I think it's unhealthy for a democracy if the center right isn't. I mean, as you see in in the States, I mean, if the yeah. center right, if, if there's nobody there. And then and I hope just for the not for any party, but for the sake of the British democracy, that the Tories will come back to their senses as soon as possible. But I think it might take a few years. I can't. Yeah, I mean, this is a it can certainly be a period of renewal for the Conservative Party in the in the UK. 
Um, one one of our viewers has a, a question about something a little bit different, which um, is about the monarchy and whether the the monarchy is in a good state um, or whether we can expect any changes there. Um, of course, that has nothing to do with the election and, and less to do with British politics per se, um, but is is certainly of interest, I think, to many people. Yeah, I mean, also the monarchy does have more to do with politics here than many people know and think. I mean, the um, the influence on politics by the British monarchy is much higher than and much more deeply entrenched than you would think and much more deeply entrenched than the influence European monarchies have, who are really just a soap opera for, for the masses, if you like. No, I mean, Charles has been um, quite... Um, Present present uh, throughout the Brexit time as well now, after the late Queen, uh, his mother, passed away by more or less, interestingly enough, being suddenly left of the government, on the left of the government by being a kind of centrist conservative, uh, also when it comes to ecology and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he's been doing that very indirectly, but he's always been hinting to not, um, liking what mistrusted and 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 the kind of very um, hostile paroles that Sunak uh, endorsed when it came to immigrants. He deliberately, for example, did big receptions in the Buckingham Palace with lots of refugees and immigrants. I mean, that's the way he can make do politics as well. I mean, so he he was quite he was trying to stabilize the system with symbolic gestures. And um, at the same time, uh, him being ill and, and Catherine being ill, it, this whole, I mean, the, the monarchy is looking a little bit frail as well at the moment. On the other hand, um, the, the kind of hope a lot of Republicans had here who wanted to abolish the monarchy and who hoped or thought their moment in time would come when the late queen would have passed away, that didn't materialize. I think, the support for the British monarchy is still very high. And I think overall, um, they're doing quite a good job by stabilizing um, the system. And I do not see them changing or um, stepping away or being abolished anytime soon. Uh, having said that, the younger generations, the polls for them are really um, declining. I mean, that's they really have a problem with the youth. They have a problem with the more diverse communities who feel appalled by Meghan and Harry having left. Uh, I think that was a mistake to do that. They could have been a good role model for the increasingly diverse um, society here. Now it's it's again a uniquely white institution, which isn't helpful. But overall, I think they're doing a pretty good job. And Charles has so far been uh, quite accepted as the new king. And there isn't there isn't much noise about them having to really change or having to step down or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think he's, he seems to be firmly, firmly installed. Yeah. Um, so, so perhaps as, as we start to come to a close, I'd like to, to maybe look across the channel again. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the relationship between the European union and the UK and, and what that might look like. Um, as you said, um, the new prime minister, Keir Starmer, has insisted that the UK will not rejoin the EU or the single market um, or the customs union. Um, but I think some people are hopeful that the relationship between the UK and the EU might open up, um, that it might improve a little bit. What, what do you see as the path forward for um, UK-EU relations? I mean, relation, UK EU relations will definitely improve. I mean, that's something that Starma has always said, and that they have interestingly started already at day on day one after they won the elections. David Lemmy was in Berlin, Stockholm, and Warsaw uh, the Saturday after they won the elections, which was quite a strong sign where they want to go. I mean, they want to definitely reinstall all those destroyed back channels. Um, they need to create trust as well. We've talked about that because there isn't much trust left. Um, in Brussels, people said, okay, fine, great. Now we have a Labour, let's see, PM, let's see. But there's a lot of reluctance to really um, to really make any steps towards Britain because in a way the deal Johnson uh, agreed with, with the EU is quite good for the EU. It's just really bad for Britain. So. Brussels isn't very motivated to do anything at the moment. And also they do not want to get into any kind of 
um, closer negotiations on anything that might be reverted by a Tory party in five years. So there is mm -hmm. a lot of, I think Starmer has to prove himself as being not only voted in by a landslide, but also by be, uh, being able to form a stable government that seems to survive the first term. And I don't think before that there will be serious talk of anything else. And as as I said before, I mean, he most most probably is aware of that. So that's why he was so reluctant to paint that picture of um, of um, rejoining soon, because he knows it's very unrealistic. Yeah. But um, apart from these major decisive steps of undoing Brexit, I think there's a lot to be done that doesn't necessarily fix the British economy. Mm -hmm. But it does set a totally different tone. And interestingly enough, and importantly enough, they will start that now with an EU-UK security pact that will be prepared by a, a German-British bilateral security pact probably already in August. So there will be a significant rapprochement quite quickly. Uh, and I think it's step by step. It's by getting to know these people in Brussels again, by understanding this a bit better, also understanding how the EU works. Sadly, the Brits have never really understood how that works. That's why they always got a bloody nose when they started to, to just ride over there and get something. That's not, I mean, the EU is a hugely highly bureaucratic institution and it's very difficult to get things easily out of them. Mm -hmm. And very, very few British PMs have really understood that. And I think also, this Labour government will have to learn that. Mm -hmm. But by, by re-establishing those uh, yeah, diplomatic and, and institutional framework that has been totally destroyed by the Tories, um, that didn't even accept an EU ambassador in London for years, yep. um, this will create a different atmosphere. And by creating a different atmosphere and get closer again and creating job friendships and diplomats yep. who meet regularly, um, Lamy will... Um, join the EU assembly. Um, so this will change things over over time. It, it will be, I think, very, very quickly a different tone, um, a different relationship, but the real the, the, the real steps of rapprochement will take time. And it mm -hmm. I think it will be small steps. Yeah. But small steps as well can have it's at some point suddenly evolve into Absolutely. some bigger movement we'll see i mean it's uh it's early days but I mean, i'm it's, quite it's, optimistic it's early days we're seeing you know obviously um some some learning curves um but there's also a long runway um with the five-year term that he has in office and so a lot a lot can happen um and many of the developments have to do with with what's going on in other places as well and so particularly sure. as one looks at at Europe um, and the election that just took place in France and the relatively weak government in Germany, um, there could be some opportunities. Uh, just last week, we had a conversation with an expert from the German Council on Foreign Relations about the French election. Yeah. And he predicted that we'll see a, a weakened relationship between Berlin and Paris, um, but suggested that there could be opportunities for a stronger connection between Berlin and London um, as a as a result. Um, Absolutely, especially as it's both social democratic governments. I mean, yeah. Olaf Scholz, who's the German chancellor, is a social democrat, as is Starmer. And there has been a lot of um, work, homework done already in the background before they won the election. So there is some closeness. Also, people know each other already. Yeah, that's definitely possible. And then you also have to take into account that Poland is now playing quite a big role in, in the new EU, uh, with Tusk um, having uh, beaten the um, nationalists and populists there. And London has traditionally a very good relationship with Poland and uh, in the Baltics as well, because they have always had military there. And uh, the Polish foreign minister, Rad Radoslaw Sikorski, has studied in Oxford and knows a lot of, knows Stammer very well personally, knows a lot of other Brits lived in London for a long time. So um, there is other players now as well, especially mm -hmm. as the German French machine is stuttering, has been stuttering for a long for a yeah, while yeah. already. So this will be all really interesting now. It's almost like the cards are being mixed. <laughs> yeah. newly. Well we'll see. But I mean this is obviously hindered by the fact that Britain isn't isn't a member of the EU. Right. Because even if if Britain manages or Starmer manages to be an important player, he will always be a third country. Yeah, Britain always will remain a third country, which isn't helpful because a lot of 
discussions do take place without Britain, as close as he might try to get in again, but without really being member or part of the EU, it will be all Britain will always play a strange role from the sidelines. Yeah, in, 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 in retrospect, I mean, as you said at the outset, um, Brexit was such a mistake for political, economic, and even social reasons, yeah. but but we're seeing that play out, and that's and that's something that that I'm sure that there's a lot of regret um, in the yeah. UK about the, the fact that this went through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Annette, herzlichen Dank. It has been an absolute delight to have this conversation with you. Um, we've covered a, a lot of ground when it comes to, to UK politics, um, and I've certainly learned a lot from our conversation. I just want to thank you again for, for taking the time to have this discussion. Thank you. It was a real pleasure talking to you. And it's always great to explain that uh, to somebody else because you understand things better yourself. And, and that was certainly the case during this, this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Well, wonderful. Good, good to see you. And thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>